Hekaya Limited presents Blossoms of the Savannah by H. R. Olekulet for Longhorn Publishers Limited. Chapter 1 Tayo stood in the shadows by the window, her back to the room. From her vantage position on the third floor of the building, where their flat was located, she had a bird's eye view of the sprawling town. The rising sun shone on rooftops, giving them a yellowish tinge. Across the roads that crisscrossed the town, diminutive figures of men and women hurried briskly to their places of work. Uniformed schoolchildren, rucksacks on their backs, jostled boisterously as they alighted from one matatu and boarded another. Beneath her, down at the courtyard, she could see her father moving and fussing he was organizing and directing with obvious shortness of temper the loading of two ten-ton lorries he was gesticulating violently apparently reprimanding loaders for being slow and inept in carrying out the task before them tayo knew her father well he was not a man who cared to have his well-laid work plans delayed or disrupted. She had noticed that he had become even more belligerent ever since the family learned that he had been retrenched, and they were now being forced to vacate the house and relocate to the rural town he had left many years back. Although the distance would not allow her to hear what he was telling the loaders, Tayo felt a mild but quite genuine twinge of sympathy for the poor fellows down there, for she knew the sting of her father's tongue. It reminded her of her own recent battle with him, when he denied her permission to travel to Mombasa with other young men and women who had been selected by an FM radio station to attend an extravaganza. She had stubbornly put up a spirited struggle, but the battle was so predictably and utterly lost. That had left a wound in her heart that was still too raw to probe. Her rage, she realized, was still seething within her. The simple faith and certainty of childhood upon which her life until then had been found had failed her. Also, her trust that her father would give her whatever she requested had been badly shaken. Stemming those thoughts out of her mind, she raised her head and looked through the morning sunbeams that gleamed brightly across the rooftops of Nakuru town, that beloved town that was the mother of all flamingos, a town that she was now about to leave. Tears welled in her eyes. She blinked suddenly and rapidly. Tayo did not hear her younger sister Resian approach. Briefly and in silence, they stood by the window, side by side, in the empty room. As far back as the two sisters could remember, they had always stood by that window every Sunday morning before they went to church. But their little habit of observing what went on below the streets of the town was made poignant that morning. It was going to be the last time they would do this. Resian leaned forward and lifted her face to look into her sister's large brown eyes. She spoke very softly, but her words were distinct and her voice very clear in the silent, empty room. Tayo, eye yo, what do you think life is going to be like in Nasila? For heaven's sake, Resian, Tayo said turning round to face her sister. How am I supposed to know? I suppose it's going to be very different from the kind of life we're used to here, isn't it? Most likely so, yes. It seems so very strange, Resian pressed on relentlessly, to be leaving Nakuru town. We have always known that it was our father's plan to end up in Nasila, Tayo told her sister trying hard not to answer her directly. That is why he built that shop that he has always spoken about. Now that he has been retrenched, she hesitated a moment. 
it transpired that the more she spoke of the relocation, the harder the reality that she was about to leave Nakuru town for good hit her. The twenty years of her life had been spent there. She loved its crowded streets, the bustle and excitement of its wholesale and retail markets, and the boisterous bus stage. But the most painful to leave behind was her boyfriend, Lenjir, the lank, dark-haired, blunt-faced young man whose big, languid eyes had always smiled at her warmly, foistering in her the dreams of young womanhood. Tayo eye yo, Resian called, lifting her head to look up suspiciously into the face of her tall sister. Is something amiss? No, nothing is amiss. I'm somehow worried, dear sister. Resian's voice dropped a little with apprehension. What do you think will happen to us if the shop father intends to open does not become as successful as he hopes? I don't know any better than you. Father thinks the shop will be a success. I overheard him tell one of his friends that he was going to stock agricultural inputs such as fertilizer, seeds, animal drugs and chemicals. Nasila is an agricultural area and business is bound to do well. Let us have faith in him and hope for the best. I don't want to work at the shop, Resian declared, her pretty face hardening and her voice sounding petulant. I want to come back to Nakuru and join Edgerton University. I want to take a course in veterinary science and become a veterinary doctor. I want to read everything that there is to be read and put on the graduation regalia at the end of four years. Yes, I like to be called Dr. Resian Kaelo. You aren't laughing, are you? I mean it. I'm not laughing, little sister, Tayo said fervently. You know too well that it is also my ardent ambition to join the university. How nice it would be if father were to allow the two of us to join. I would love it. It would be wonderful, Resian said excitedly the elation evident in her voice. You will then persuade father to allow us to come back to Nakuru and join the university, won't you? Tayo eye yo. I can't promise that with certainty, Tayo said, and tore her look away from her sister's face. You know the stubborn nature of father. She looked down into the courtyard, where their father was still busy moving from one lorry to the other, making sure that their furniture was loaded as fittingly as possible, so that it did not break on the way. When she heard him yell at one of the workers, a cold knot of anger and resentment tightened in the pit of her stomach, a flash of almost physical pain. She wondered what made her sister think she would be able to persuade their father to allow them to come back to Nakuru and join the university if that was not his intention. Once more, she recalled with bitterness how her father's refusal to allow her to go to Mombasa and participate in the musical extravaganza had nearly damaged the father-daughter relationship that had always been remarkably close. Please try to talk to him, won't you? Tayo Eyeyo, Resian pleaded persuasively. He always listens to you, and this time round he will. Just try. I'll try, Tayo said doubtfully to close the delicate subject. Behind them, and from the adjacent room, their mother's voice rose, the edge of complaint in it making them take keener interest on what was happening down there at the courtyard. At that very moment, their father craned his neck and looked up, as if to see what they were doing at the window. Taiyo, what on earth are you doing there at the window, instead of helping me pack? their mother asked sharply. And to Resian, run downstairs and check what is happening. 
Are we ever going to leave? They have completed loading the lorries, Yeyo, Tayo said nonchalantly. Turning to her sister and nudging her urgently, she added, Here comes Baba. Quick, let's go. We better be found in the company of Yeyo when he comes. Otherwise, he will spoil our day with his sharp tongue. They giggled as they rushed out. The two girls were with their mother, gathering suitcases, placing them at the doorway, ready to carry them downstairs, when their father entered the now empty living room. Ready to go? Kaelo asked, addressing no one in particular. We must start our journey straight away, if we are to get to Nasila early enough to offload the trucks and arrange the furniture in our new house. That short speech poignantly brought reality to them. They were now about to leave Nakuru town for good. Ole Kaelo cleared his throat loudly. His wife, Mama Milanoi, took out a handkerchief from her pocket and blew her nose. The four of them stood there for a moment in a sudden silence, each one of them keeping their thoughts to themselves. But one thing that was clear to all of them was that the flat that had been their home for so many years, stripped of all furniture, of all personal possessions, all books, pictures and ornaments, now looked bleak and shabby. Well, Mama Milanoi's voice wavered a little. Let's pray that the good Lord gives us journey mercies. And she prayed. Then, with a last glance about her, Mama Milanoi got hold of one of the suitcases and led the way out of the flat. Her husband followed, and together they preceded their daughters out of that flat. Tayo was the last to leave. She turned at the doorway, stood for a long moment, looking back into the room that she had seen all of her childhood. Then, with tears in her eyes, firmly closed the door and followed the others down the stairs. Minutes later, when all of them were settled in the 14-seater minibus that Ole Kaelo had hired for them, the journey began in earnest. Father and mother sat in the front seat, while the girls shared the back seat with the suitcases and other hand luggage. The two lorries snaked ahead of them. Mama Milanoi settled in her seat, and the vehicle sped steadily out of Nakuru town. She gave thought to the bigger picture of their relocation. When her husband broke the news that he had been retrenched, she was dumbfounded. It was as though a thunderbolt had struck her out of a midday blue sky. Ever since she got married to Ole Kaelo 22 years earlier, Agribix Limited had been her husband's employer and the sole source of her family's livelihood. Now that it was closing its door on them, she felt as if Providence itself was turning off the valve that supplied the vital air that sustained their lives. But her husband had received the distressing news stoically. He had said it was an inevitability that was always coming. It began its journey the day he was engaged, and now, like a baby who must be born at the fullness of time, this had come to pass. He counselled and convinced her that she had nothing to fear, for he had prepared for that eventuality. He was of the opinion that they could go back home and start afresh, embrace the life of their community. Once she was convinced that relocation would enable them to begin a new phase of life, she became unflaggingly enthusiastic. She began to see in her mind how a brand new house and a well-stocked shop that her husband promised to set up on the right side of Nasila town predictably offered glamour and a chance to be associated with the great and the powerful of the land. She saw a chance for her family to join the good fortune enjoyed by those who already happily settled in the rural town. But above all, she thought, it would be easier to marry off her two girls in the new town than in the melting pot that Nakuru town had become. Yes, 
two sons-in-law from reputable families in the land could easily catapult them right into the centre of the affairs of the community. That could be the re-entry point into the community that they had been thinking about, she thought contentedly. There was, however, a dark spot in the whole affair. Women friends from Nasila, who had visited her in the past, had asked her very intrusive questions regarding her daughters. At that time, she dismissed them as busybodies who enjoyed intrusion into other people's affairs. But it now dawned on her that those could be the mothers of her would-be sons-in-law. The words they used to describe the status of her daughters came back to haunt her, like demented spirits of a past that was better forgotten. In Toye Nemegalana, they had called them contemptuously. On his part, Parsimei Olekaelo sat quietly beside his wife, his mind roaming the distant past in reminiscence. He knew that he had worked his fingers to the bone over the years, preparing for that day when he was no longer going to be employed. He was on his way to opening up his business. Not that he felt any particular excitement or pleasure. He was a man to whom disappointment came more easily and naturally than contentment, and that latter attribute fired his ambition to always strive for the stars. It was characteristic of him that surrounded by what other men would have considered evidence of a well-earned successful life, he felt nothing but the need to strive even harder to achieve better results. He had a contentious mind that seemed to question every aspect of his life. Although he was blessed with a shrewd brain and a pugnacious obstinacy that had stood him in good stead in his struggle to rise through the ranks from a clerk to the coveted position of commercial manager of the Agribix Limited, he still saw only the greater successes of others. Even on the family front, he felt cheated by nature. For although it had been his prayer to get at least three boys, he had ended up with two girls. But even more obnoxious was the fact that despite all his achievements, it seemed to him that his younger brother, Simiren, who remained in Nasila, had been more appreciated and was considered the cultural head of the Kaelos by the community. That hurt him, but it did not worry him. Since childhood, he had been aware, without self-pity, that no one really liked him. That, too, did not bother him, since in his mind, to pursue the easy and worthless admiration of others was a sign of weakness of character. Nature had not, however, been totally inconsiderate. It rewarded him with a gem in the form of his wife, Jane Milanoi. When he first saw her at a church service at Nasila, he was stunned. She was then hardly eighteen. Her body had now ripened to a sensual womanhood, completely at odds with her childlike face. She wore her jet-black hair in braids that accentuated her wide eyes. Her breasts were full and heavy, her waist slender, her hips wide and seductively curved. And the dress she wore, a simple red frock, fitted well her tall, shapely figure. From the moment he saw her, he had been obsessed. And against all odds, and despite all efforts, he was still so obsessed twenty-two years later. His marriage to her had been a great success. His two daughters occupied separate parts of his heart. Dayo, his eldest, was his pride. When she was born, twenty years earlier, his heart was enthralled. She was the proof of his fatherhood. When his wife got pregnant the second time, he prayed for a healthy baby boy who would carry the Caelo's name to the next generation. But that was not to be. Against his expectation and to his utter disappointment, 
nature had given him another baby girl. From the moment she was born, mute and helpless, he detested her. The very sight of her enraged him. Her arrival and her continued stay in her father's home remained unwelcome and detested. And right from her cradle, baby Resian instinctively detected the absence of love from her father. She grew up sullen, bewildered, and resentful. As a result, her nature was darkened by melancholy. Self-doubt made her awkward and very difficult to deal with, and that made him detest her even more. Even her physical appearance angered her father. Like her sister Taiyo, at eighteen, she had grown almost as tall as her father, but unlike Taiyo, who was still skinny and symmetrical in formation, Resian's body had blossomed early. Signs of early womanhood were evident. The earlier he disposed of her, he declared to himself angrily, the better. A few kilometres to Nasila, one of the lorries developed a mechanical problem and broke down. The other two vehicles stopped behind it, the crew alighted, and immediately swung into action. While Ole Kaelo fussed around the vehicles, cursing and muttering expletives under his breath, Mama Milanoi and her daughters alighted and stood beside the vehicle. They huddled stoically together, eyes downcast, saying little. They knew thieves, robbers, rapists, carjackers and hooligans lurked everywhere and could strike at any moment. They therefore stood waiting with fatalistic resignation for the worst. Taiyu and Resian, both head and shoulder taller than their mother, stood on each side to protect her more from the cold blowing wind than from the fear of the marauding thugs. Here comes Vavai, Taiyo said with relief. He is waving at us to get back into the vehicle. I think they have fixed the lorry. Soon the vehicles roared, and within no time they were rolling into the small town of Nasila. Taiyo and Resian strained their eyes in the evening darkness to see the town that was to be their new home. Their arrival came sooner than expected. The gates of their uncle Semiren's homestead, where they were received, swung open, and a crowd of jubilant relatives who had been waiting to welcome them surged forward to greet them. When they stepped out of the vehicle, the girls were hugged, kissed, and their heads touched by uncles, cousins, aunts, and other relatives they had never met. There was so much noise, laughter, singing, and dancing that the girls, who least expected such a reception, were confused. Soon they were all seated around a bright fire lit in the middle of the homestead, enjoying pieces of roasted meat. For the thirty years or so that Parsime Ole Kaelo was away in Nakuru, his younger brother Simiren acted as the head of the Kaelo family. He ably represented the family in the Imolelian clan to which they belonged. When they were Italengo to be performed, such as the initiation of girls, the circumcision of boys, or betrothal ceremonies, he was always there representing his elder brother and his clan, and he was a strict adherent to his people's customs and traditions, for which reason he was respected and appreciated by the elders. There had never been any argument or rivalry between him and his brother. Ever since they were young, and as they grew up, Simiren had always accepted his position to be subordinate to his elder brother. The fact that he had four wives and sixteen children, while his brother had only one and two children, did not make any difference. Parsime Olekaelo was still the Olmorijoy, and he still humbled himself before him. During Parsime Olekaelo's absence, Simiran ran all kinds of errands for him. Many times, 
he sent him money to purchase livestock alongside his own. He drove them to Dagoretti cattle market, where he sold them at a profit, and brought back the money to him. Seeing the rate at which his money multiplied, made Parsime Olecaelo appreciate and respect his younger brother's experience as an Olkunchai. When Parsime Olecaelo put up two buildings in Nasila, a shop and residential house, his brother participated fully in the construction. As Simiren and the clan elders sat around the fire, entertaining his elder brother, he thought quietly over how things might change. And as chunks of meat went round, he furtively looked at his brother as he selected a piece from the tray and wondered what was going through his mind. He hoped that Parsime would appreciate that the weighty burden of matters pertaining to the Kailo family would henceforth rest squarely on his able and mature shoulders. He, however, envisaged some problems. He had informed Ole Kaelo on many occasions in the past that there were murmurs in the clan about him. Elders had termed reckless his decision to remain married to only one wife, who had only borne him two daughters. They had likened him to a mono-eyed giant who stood on legs of straw. Parsime had got angry and called the clan elders megalomaniacs who were still trapped in archaic traditions that were better buried and forgotten. Simiren did not argue with him then, nor would he do so now. He would rather have matters take their own course. There was, however, a more sensitive matter that had not been broached. It had to do with his daughters. He had hardly given thought to their age earlier, but when he saw them that evening, he knew they should have left home long ago. It would not take long before his brother earned himself the derogatory name of the father of Intoye Nemegalana. <laughs>